my Rigid Heddle Weavers, Tammy Pop here, author of Woven Style for the 15-inch Rigid Heddle Loom and Color and Texture for the Rigid Heddle Loom. In these books, I give you my highly opinionated advice on breaking new ground with your weaving. We're still on lockdown from the coronavirus crisis of 2020, but it's a beautiful day in Tucson, Arizona, and I want to send you some sunshine to help you stay positive, along with five ways to improve your weaving right now. Part one, warping tricks. So let's go outside and do a little warping together. So working in my backyard today should demonstrate that you can warp and weave just about anywhere. I work almost exclusively with a direct warp rather than using a warping board because most of my weavers don't own that piece of equipment. If you came to Rigid Heddle Weaving from the floor loom, you're more likely to work with a warping board, but I like to keep it simple. I've got my loom set up today on the floor stand and notice I've got a potted plant that works very nicely to keep that in place as I warp outside here. Trick number one, the one finger flick. Making the warp go around the apron rod sometimes is a problem for my new weavers. They struggle with the idea of how to make that yarn go around the rod on a continuous strand each time they draw a loop. So the first thing that I remind them of is when we tie on to the rod, the very first time there is no under or over, just straight forward and draw a loop. Once a loop is drawn the first time, <clears throat> the yarn is sitting under the rod. So our task is to simply make it go up and forward towards the reed and draw the loop. Now with the next loop we draw, the yarn sits on top of the rod and we have to draw it under to get it forward to the reed. So here we go, my one finger flick. With your longest finger, the middle finger, reach in front of the apron rod and snag that yarn and drag it forward to draw the next loop. Now, isn't that a lot easier than trying to push yarn under the rod and having your fingers get in the way? Trick number two, using multiple pegs or moving your warping peg. We've drawn several loops in this short warp. Since it's fairly wide, 18 inches, I placed two pegs on my patio fire table here, about nine inches apart. When you have a width like this one, what you're avoiding with extra pegging is the extra long salvage threads that result in a lot of waste when you only peg to the center. So if you're like me, you got two looms, you got two pegs, but if you only have one, here's what you do. Warp the first section, cut the loop, tie the knot, let it drop, then you can go on to warp the second section. Saves a lot of yarn. Trick number three, what do you pack your warp with? In a moment, I'm going to show you my method for winding on, but first, you're going to love this if you haven't tried it. The moment that warp ends roll under warp ends, and this is right about where the apron rod hits the warp when you first start to roll. You know that we need to pack something between the layers. Now we use lots of things like craft paper, warp sticks placed at intervals. Some people even use cheap plastic blinds cut to size. My favorite packing is rubberized shelf liner. Now this was first introduced to me by two really creative students of mine, Sarah Lee and Ellie. And at first I thought that it would be too spongy, but it works like a charm. I had a class where all we had to pack our warp with was paper towel, and believe me, that's a nightmare I do not want to repeat. So this liner doesn't tear, doesn't bunch, doesn't shift, as long as you set it right. What I do is get down here level with the warp beam and I set the liner as straight across as I can. Now while I'm still holding it with two hands, because if I let go of one side to hand to use the crank, it's going to shift. So right while I am holding it, I force the warp beam without letting go to turn and catch the liner. And now it's going to roll continuously without interruption. Trick number four, winding on all by yourself. Most of the time I'm working at home alone and frankly, even if my husband is around, 
I don't have time to wait for him to watch that last golf stroke on TV to get some help. So I use the following method to wind on by myself and it has given me consistently the best results for many years. Now first let me say I am not a yank and crank kind of girl. To show you what that is, that's a method where you roll your warp for a short distance, allowing the heddle to provide a minimum amount of tension. And then you grab the warp in sections and give it a yank across to do your tensioning. If you're a fan of that technique, you'll have to forgive me, but I just can't trust that my little heddle will provide any kind of consistent tension and then yank away. What if I don't yank consistently? What if the warp gets caught on the heddle? So I do this. I grab all of the ends in one group and make a nice firm triangle. And then I often push down on the front beam to assist with that tensioning. Now I roll continuously until the warp threads start to look a little crisscross and wonky. Now here comes that dreaded comb. Some weavers will tell you never comb your warp. The fear is that you might comb inconsistently and affect attention in a negative way. Try to stay with that when your warp is mohair. That stuff sticks to the reed like crazy as you wind. I have no doubt that these folks are closet combers when it comes to mohair. I don't think these guys hang around with the yank and crankers either. Anyway, I have no problem with combing as needed to get back to a nice consistent triangle and then continue to wind. The only thing you don't want to do, if you have a buddy helping you roll, you don't want to be combing while they're rolling. Trick number five, slaying the reed. This is actually a number of little tricks, but I didn't want to have to rename the video. After winding on, we're ready to slay the reed. In other words, we want to relocate one strand of every loop into the adjacent slot or hole to fill in the openings. By the way, I tell my students the best place to stop winding if you've used a, a loose knot to keep your warp ends together is right where the cut ends just kiss the front beam. We'll untie that knot. As we slay our strands, a lot of us want to just go in there with the hook and grab at the yarn to slay it through. That's a really great way to split your yarn, especially if you have a fragile yarn. Here's what I recommend. Identify the strand that you want to move out of the two strands. Put, them under, put that strand under a little tension. So you can put it between your thumb and forefinger, and then you go in and lay your hook onto that area of tension. Draw it through. Use the whole shaft to draw that strand out of the hole through the slot nice and smooth. Now you can also do this. Identify the strand you want to move and make a little loop. Then you've got something to aim at. Lay your hook onto that loop, pull back a little. You've got some tension, use the whole shaft of the hook, draw it through nice and clean, minimizes splitting. By the way, nine out of ten of us find that hook facing down is the easiest way to grab onto the yarn and to pull it through. But then again, there's always one renegade, right? Either way you do it. One of my students came up with a really great idea. To identify hook down position very quickly, she put a dot of red nail polish on top of the hook handle. Also, if you have trouble identifying which of the strands you've separated, and where you need to continue across, I recommend that you divide and conquer. If you take the threads that are left in the holes and put them up and over the top of the reed, and you take the strands in the slots that you've already separated and throw those off to the right the best you can, now you've separated them and you can easily see where you need to continue across. By the way, don't let this confuse you. Normally you will have drawn all your loops through slots and relocate the extra strand into the 
empty holes. You can see here that I've drawn my loops through holes, then slots, then holes, then slots. In between, I've skipped a heddle. That's because this is for a very specific pattern for my next book. So we all come from a different place as we learn our craft, and I hope you were able to garner a few tips that you may not have considered. Subscribe to my channel and you can look for my next video, now in the works, Six Ways to Improve Your Rigid Heddle Weaving, Part 2, Weaving Tricks. So here's wishing you a happy sunny day from Tucson, Arizona, my friends. Stay safe and keep on weaving.